About a year and a half ago, we had a little bit of a health scare with one of our children, Heidi. Heidi had not eaten food for several days. She was feeling sick and she was starting to throw up and she was feeling just overall very weak, very sick, very down. And you know, the worst thing you can do as a parent at that point is pull out your phone and Google. Because then it's everything. <laughs> she has everything. And you know, if it's just a day or two, you kind of, you know, kids get sick. It just is what it is. But when it goes on for two days and then three days and then four days and your kid's just not eating and she's throwing up and not keeping anything down, you start to panic a little bit. So we took her to the emergency room and the emergency room said, well, we just, we don't, we're not set up to take a look at a, you know, a child this size. We're going to send you over to Phoenix Children's Hospital. We went to Phoenix Children's Hospital and I was there by myself with Heidi, and we spent a very long night together going from room to room and doctor to doctor and having tests run. And it was a very long night, waiting, waiting to find out what was wrong with my little girl. Now, I'm not crying, so you know that things turned out all right, and obviously she's sitting there next to Rebecca feeling just fine now. And as it turned out, it, it was not a major health concern, and there was actually a fairly simple solution to the problem that we were facing, and she's just fine now, no long-term side effects at all. But the waiting, the waiting is the hardest part. Waiting rooms are miserable places, aren't they? Waiting rooms have uncomfortable chairs. Waiting rooms have poor lighting usually. You always wonder like who was the person in the wait you know who was the person in the in the waiting room chair before me? Like what 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 malady did that person have an hour ago and now I'm sitting in it? The magazines are always like really old. They're always like 5-year-old uh, like ladies home journals. You know like Waiting rooms are miserable places. And being forced to wait for something, especially when it's something like a health scare for yourself or one of your family members, is typically thought of as a bad sort of thing. Now, even the great Dr. Seuss had a few things to say about the, the feeling of futility that comes along with waiting. In what I think is Dr. Seuss's best book, Oh, the Places You'll Go, he had a few things to say about one place called The Waiting Place. Dr. Seuss said this, People are just waiting, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or a no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. They're waiting for the fish to bite, waiting for wind to fly a kite, waiting around for Friday night, waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake or a pot to boil or a better break or a string of pearls or a pair of pants or a wig with curls or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. Now, given everything that I've said about waiting, you'd think there really isn't a whole lot of benefit to it. But that's exactly what I want to consider today. What is the spiritual benefit to waiting? What do we learn when we are forced to wait for something? When we are forced to come face to face with our mortality? When we're forced to be patient about things? What is the benefit to waiting? Let's begin in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 as a scriptural starting point for this. Periods of waiting, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, are a normal and necessary part of life. Notice what he says to say here about the appointed or perfect time for everything. He says in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1, there's an appointed time or an appropriate time for everything. There's a time for every event under heaven. And you have to let things happen in their time, by the way. You can't rush certain things. Certain things have to be allowed to develop in their own natural or organic way. Verse 2, there's a time to give birth and there's also a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. 
A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and also a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Verse 5. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. There's a time to search and a time to give up is lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Verse 7. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and even a time to hate. There's a time for war and a time for peace. In summation, he goes on to say in chapter 7 and verse 8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness or arrogance of spirit. He says it's better to let things happen in their own time. He says when you are patient and you allow the end of a matter to come to fruition in its own time, being patient is more rewarding than being arrogant. Now you might call you might call it arrogance or haughtiness. Maybe it's just the idea that you can take control of situations that are out of your control. Maybe it's just the idea that you, in your infinite wisdom and power, can rush on ahead to the next step when you're not actually ready to move on to the next step. And I think that's what it means there by the haughtiness of spirit. Haughtiness of spirit says, I don't have to be patient. Haughtiness of spirit says, I'm always ready for the next thing. Haughtiness of spirit says, I don't have to listen to my elders. I don't have to listen to my parents. I don't have to listen to the people who walked this road before me and maybe, just maybe, know a little bit more about it than I do. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. And just like the hymn, Teach Me, Lord, to Wait... Waiting is a learned skill. Waiting does not necessarily come naturally to us. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Teach me, mom and dad, to wait. Teach me, spouse, to wait. And I've found in my life, teach me my children, my kids. Teach me how to wait. I don't think anything has happened to me in life, at least in an earthly sense, that has taught me to be more patient than having children. And that's not a joke, and it's not a knock on my children, by the way. But I think that is absolutely true. And if you've had kids, I think you could agree with me, at least in some sense. So, with the rest of our lesson, let's consider some of the practical benefits of being forced to wait for things. Even things, again, things that are uncomfortable, things that cause you anxiety or stress, even things that might be life-threatening. What is the benefit to being forced to wait? Well, let's have this idea here. Some things take time. Some things take time time. James 5 and verse 7. Notice what the writer has to say here in James 5 and verse 7. The benefit that comes along with being willing to wait. He says here, be patient therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the, the late rains. Kind of harkens back to that Ecclesiastes 3 passage, doesn't it? There's a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. There's a time to plant things, but you've got to be patient about it because you can't uproot something until it's ready. You can't pick the corn. You can't pick the tomatoes. You can't harvest the fruit until it's actually ready to be harvested. So be patient like a farmer who's patient and waits for the right time to harvest we have to be patient with God. That's the big picture that James is getting at. Because obviously, there's all kinds of practical benefits to being patient. You've got to be patient with your career. You've got to be patient with your kids. You've got to be patient if you're growing tomatoes on your back patio. But the point James is making is, those are all just little tiny applications of the bigger, broader point of be patient when it comes to God. God is going to take His time. And when you are dealing with a being 
who sees time as malleable, right? For him, a thousand years is like a day, and a day can be like a thousand years. When you're dealing with a being like that, whose concept of time is beyond what we're capable of understanding, you have got to be patient with God. Because He's going to work in His own time, whether you like it or not, whether it's convenient or not, God is going to work in His own time. Even people like Abraham Abraham needed to learn patience. Even people like Abraham, who Hebrews 11 makes very clear was an incredibly faithful person, even Abraham had to accept God's timetable for things. In Hebrews 11, verse 13, for example, speaking of the great faithfuls of old, many of them never got to see the fruition of the promises. Many of them never got to see the promises come to life in their own physical lifetimes. Abraham only got to see it from a distance and only in part. Moses only got to see the promised land from the top of a mountain and only from a distance. And he never got to enter that promised land himself. Many of the great heroes of faith in the Bible, they they didn't see a thousand years into the future. But they knew that God would answer their prayers at some point. Maybe a thousand years in the future. Maybe the next day. But they all had to accept that God was going to fulfill His promises in His own way, in His own time. Go to Hebrews chapter 6 if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles. In Hebrews chapter 6, notice what the writer has to say here. In Hebrews 6, and I know it's a longer passage, but begin in verse 10, just so we've got the full context. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward His name, in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. As in, God's not going to forget what you do. When you spend your life working for God, it's not like God's going to lose the paperwork on Judgment Day. He's not going to be like, Goodwin, uh, Goodwin, good, uh, mm, uh, Robert Goodwin? I'm sorry, we just don't have you on file here, Mr. What was it again? He's not going to lose the paperwork on Ryan Goodwin on Judgment Day. Verse 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Why, why until the end? Because you don't really know how things are going to turn out until the end. We would be very disappointed with basically every movie that's ever made if we walked out of the theater three quarters of the way through. It, I mean, if you walked out of the theater going like, I just, I mean, that, that whole story about Frodo, he just, I don't think he's going to make it. But keep going here in verse 12, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, for example, in verse 13, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, I will surely multiply you, I'll surely multiply you and bless you. And thus having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Well, in what sense? Because Abraham didn't actually see all the world blessed through his seed. Abraham didn't actually see his descendants like the sand of the seashore and the stars of the heavens. He didn't actually see his descendants possess the land of Canaan. But you know what? When you trust God, when you believe that God is going to keep His promises, if not now, if not tomorrow, if not a thousand years from now, but He definitely will in His time, I think you can go to the judgment day. You can go to your death fully assured of the things that have been promised by God. Some things take time. But let's consider another point here. Patience or being forced to wait gives us time to reflect on things. Jonah had to sit and stew for three days in the belly of a fish. And I wonder if it took the full three days. I, I wonder sometimes when I read the story of Jonah, he gets swallowed up by a, by a great sea creature of some kind, and he's stuck in that belly for three days. Do you think it took the full three days? It might have. Now, I'm not saying it definitely did or whatever, but you know, you could think like, could God have left him in there for three hours? Sure. 
maybe one day. Maybe I'm going to let him sleep on it one night. Why did it take three days? I don't know. Sometimes I think maybe it took Jonah the full three days because he needed to sit for three days in the stinking, steamy belly of a great sea creature. And he needed to sit and stew for a while and think about what he had done and his choices. Being forced to wait forces you to think about what you've done. It gives you time to reflect on things. Now, I know that's hard because we have all this stimulation that's around us, right? We've we've got our phones and we've got social media and we, we we can't hardly stand to stand in line at the grocery store without pulling our phones out. I mean, we can't just, we can't wait in line for three minutes at the grocery store without going, well, I, I gotta look at something. We, we can't hardly stand it. So, one thing that I've done, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, by the way, okay, I, man, I pull my phone, I gotta check sports scores or whatever. I'm, I'm as bad as anybody else, okay, but one thing I've done is, I've tried to recognize the way that this has impacted my life in a negative way to where I don't have an attention span. I don't have the patience that I should have, that I need to have. So one thing that I have done is I try to spend some small amount of time every day with my phone off, with my computer closed, and I just stare at the wall doing nothing. Now, I'm not joking about that. I'm not meaning to be silly or anything. But I will spend five minutes and up to 20 minutes, right? Between five and 20 minutes, just whatever I can get in that day. And I will turn everything off. And I will sit in my office chair, in my office up there, for five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. And I will sit and stare at the wall and do nothing. And I just allow my mind to go wherever it wants. Whatever my mind wants to think about, whatever direction it wants to go, I let it go wherever it wants. Because that's a skill that I think we failed at. We've kind of lost it as a culture is the ability to just sit and do nothing. Sometimes in life, you just got to wait. And you just got to do nothing. Sometimes in life, that is what life asks of you. And you're not always going to be entertained by everything or stimulated by something. Sometimes you just got to sit and do nothing. Because when you're doing nothing, in those moments of silence, when your phone is off and the music is off and the TV is off, it's, kind of, it's in those moments that I think the voice of God is finally allowed to speak to us. Now, understand what I'm saying. I, I'm not saying there's some still small voice that's going to tell you what to do in life and you're going to receive some kind of miraculous inspiration. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when we turn the TV off and turn the sound off and turn the phone off, we finally allow our minds to dwell on something that's beyond sports or entertainment or media. We finally allow something spiritual to creep in and grow in our lives. I like the way it's put in Lamentations chapter 3. Right after the book of Jeremiah, go to Lamentations. And notice in Lamentations 3, beginning in verse 25, and I don't know if we'll read the whole passage here, but just consider a couple things here. In Lamentations 3.25, The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the person who seeks Him. It is good that He waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Because you know what? God doesn't need your opinion on everything. Think about that. God doesn't need your opinion on everything. It's good that we wait silently for the Lord because God doesn't need our opinion on everything. God, would you hurry up? God, that's not how I would have done it. God, you know, your timetable might be a little bit off. God, I've got other things to be doing right now. I'm a busy man. God doesn't need your opinion on everything. Sit in silence. Wait silently for the Lord. It's good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and be silent since God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is... What he means is to to bow down in prayer. To put your mouth in the dust means to bow down your face to the ground, right? Put your mouth in the dust because perhaps... 
And I like the way he puts that, perhaps. Perhaps when we can close our mouths for a little while. Perhaps when we can open up our minds and listen to God. Perhaps when we can stop spouting our own opinions. Perhaps when we can stop worrying about our own social media and our own carefully crafted image that we present to the world. Perhaps there's hope for us still. And we can sit and be silent in the presence of the Almighty. To be silent in the presence of the Creator. To admire Him and glorify Him and recognize Him and honor Him and listen to Him. And perhaps, if you can learn to do that a little bit better, Jeremiah says perhaps there's still hope for you. Being forced to wait helps clarify what you really want. Let me ask you something. If I told you, and you actually believe me, because it's a silly thing, I know, in a hypothetical world, okay, that God was going to come back in judgment in two minutes, 120 seconds, okay, you've got 120 seconds, God is coming back. And if I told you two minutes, okay, that's all, just two minutes, can you not sin for the next two minutes and go to heaven? I think everybody in this room would probably say, yeah. Can you, can you keep your greed under control for two minutes? That's all. Can you not lie for two minutes? Like, just don't lie for two minutes. Can you keep your lust under control? Like, keep your, keep your head down, focus on. Can you keep your lust under control for just two minutes? Can you not murder someone for two minutes? If I told you that you could have heaven in two minutes, you think you could muster up the gumption to do it? Yeah. I think so. But you know what? We're not told that heaven is going to come in two minutes. Now, it might. But what if heaven doesn't come for two years? Or 200 years? Or 2,000 years? See, that's where the problem comes in, isn't it? When you are forced to wait for something, you find out how much you actually want it. Going back to our example from Disney, okay? You know, you go to Disney World or Disneyland, and you see the sign there that says, the wait for this ride is an hour and 45 minutes. And you're going, I don't really know if I want to ride it that much. When you are forced to wait an hour and 45 minutes for the Indiana Jones ride, you find out very quickly how much you actually want to ride it. Now, if, if it's a two-minute wait, I mean, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, it's not the best ride at the park, but you know what? The, the wait is only two minutes, so, I mean, I'm sure, I'll go ride it. And if heaven was only two minutes away, yeah, you would do everything you could within your power to make it to heaven if you only had two minutes of concerted effort to make it. But when you're forced to wait for heaven for two years or 20 years or the rest of your life, that's when you find out how much you actually want heaven. If you really want it, are you willing to wait for it? Because if you're not willing to wait, maybe you don't actually want it that much. And I, maybe that's one of the issues where we struggle with faithfulness and spiritual discipline. Why our prayer life struggles. Why our study life struggles. Why we struggle with our worship. Why we struggle with our devotion. You know, our spiritual discipline struggles when we don't think that something is kind of right there in front of us. If you're training for a marathon, but the marathon is still like three months away you can kind of write off like, well, I'm just not going to run today. I still got three months. I got three months left. If I skip my run today, what's the big deal? If I, if I, you know, skimp a little bit and quit early, what's the big deal? But if the marathon's tomorrow, quite frankly, you're out of time. Because if you ain't ready for it tomorrow, there's nothing you can do to get ready for it at that point. And if you're forced to wait in a long line, I guess you just kind of find out how much you actually care about something. Now, I should clarify, we should want heaven. It should be our greatest desire. And it will not be disappointing. Let's say you do wait an hour and 45 minutes for a ride and you just kind of end up going, 
meh. That is not going to be our attitude when we get to heaven. It's not going to be like a, eh, it's okay. That's all right. He said streets of gold, but you know, I've always preferred silver. Consider a couple scriptures here. In Philippians chapter 1, for example. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, look at the desire that Paul the Apostle has. I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Go to chapter 3 and verse 20 of the same book. Philippians 3 and verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8. Go a few pages back in the New Testament and go to Romans chapter 8. And Notice here, Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 18 where it says, For I consider the su- that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Even the creation itself is eagerly anticipating the judgment day so that it can be released from its futility. He goes on to say in verse 23, and not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Are you excited about the resurrection? I am Are you excited about heaven? I am. Are you excited to finally be done with tears and sorrow and grief? I am. And we ought to be excited about it. We should want heaven. Whether it comes in two minutes or two years or two thousand years. Because it's worth it. Waiting for an answer gives you time to prepare for the answer. Going back to the example from Heidi. When you Google symptoms, boy, you, you find a lot of things on the internet that are pretty scary. I won't tell you all the symptoms that she had, but, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, this is absolutely not meant to be like, Ryan's such a silly, stupid dad or anything, look how funny he is. It's, when you list out all the symptoms, because you kind of want to know, like, well, what are we looking at here? What, what are the possibilities? I mean, she was either going to have appendicitis or leukemia. And I'm not crazy about either of those things. But I'll tell you what. It was nice to have a little bit of time to sit and think about it. To ponder it. Because if it had been appendicitis and she needed to go in for emergency surgery, or if it had been leukemia and we were looking at some really major thing, I kind of would want some time to process that. I know that it's frustrating when we have to wait for an answer. We've got to wait for a doctor, wait for a test result. You know, when you have to sit and wait for something that's causing anxiety, the, the one kind of benefit there, not the only benefit, I, don't, I shouldn't say the one, but one benefit to that is, let's say it's a worst case scenario. Let's say it is cancer. And the doctor says, we'll get back to you. We've got some test results we're going to run. But it might be this. And you've got to sit and think about it for a week. Now that's a long week. That's, a, that's an anxiety-filled week. That is a stressful week. It's a miserable and uncomfortable week. I get that. But that's also a week where you get to sit and think about what your priorities are. It's a week where you get to process If this is a worst case scenario, take a breath. What are we going to do? It's a week where you get to plan something. It's a week where you get to talk to people. It's a week where you get to pray and draw closer to God. It's a week where you actually get to think about what am I going to do? What is my plan? What are my priorities? How am I going to respond to this in the most spiritually mature and productive way that I can? We don't like to wait. But if it's a worst case scenario kind of thing, being forced to wait helps you have time to process the worst case scenario. 
Think about Genesis chapter 18. God comes in the form of a visitor to Abraham's camp. And they have a meal together and they talk about this and that and God reaffirms His blessings and promise to Abraham. But then He says to the companions, He sends them away to Sodom and Gomorrah where Abraham's nephew Lot is living. And Abraham has a really interesting conversation at the end of the chapter with God. I I think he knows it's God, by the way. I, I think he believes that this is God standing before him in some kind of visage. And so they're standing there kind of looking off towards Sodom and Abraham says... Let's just say hypothetically. Let, let's say there are 50 righteous people in Sodom. Are you going to spare the city for that? What if there are 40 righteous? What if there are 30? And God says, yeah, I'll spare the city for 50 or 40 or 30 or 20. And, and Abraham, with some trepidation, kind of, what if there are only 10 righteous people in Sodom? Will you spare the city of Sodom then for only 10 righteous people? Yeah, I'll spare the city for ten righteous people. Now, this whole time, does God know how many righteous people there are in Sodom? Yes. He's omniscient. He knows. Now, He wants to go see it for Himself. He even explains it to Him. I've come to see with my own eyes if Sodom is as bad as I think that it is. Now, that's not because He doesn't know that He's not omniscient. It's just that He wants to give Sodom every bit of credit that He can, every opportunity, right? Right? Though there's no arguing with God that He saw it with His own eyes how bad it was. But this whole time, God knows how many righteous people there are on Sodom. So this conversation between Abraham and God is not for God's benefit. It's for Abraham's benefit. Because what if it is a worst case scenario? And what if God does destroy the city of Sodom? And what if Lot's life is ruined because of it? Abraham has to have time to sit and process the possible worst case scenario. Let's end with this idea. In Psalm 27, yes, wait on the Lord. Go to Psalm 27 and let's notice here a few things from this wonderful, beautiful, and encouraging passage of Scripture. In Psalm 27, in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Through a host, though a host encamp me, my heart will never fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Why? Not because, because of his own strength or his own ability. I shall be confident because of God. Because God is always with me in verse 4. Because He's like a rock in verse 5. Because in verse 7, the Lord hears me when I cry to Him. So He sends in verse 11. He says, Teach me Thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. 